This video is sponsored by Scentbird, the only monthly cologne and perfume subscription service out there that I trust. I've been using Scentbird for the better part of a year, and finding new colognes has never been more convenient. Through Scentbird, I found all of my favorite fragrances, and I've never gotten as many compliments on my colognes as I did this past year. Scentbird carries all the top fragrance brands with over 600 perfumes and colognes and a lot of unisex options, and it delivers them right to your door for just $17 a month. With each fragrance, you'll get a 30-day supply, so you can try out fragrances before committing to a full-size bottle. Some of the scents I received this month are African Rooibos by Chris Collins and The Hedonist by Ex Nihilo. Each bottle comes with a card which explains what the fragrance smells like, so African Rooibos has a scent that mixes the aromas of cardamom, tonka bean, orris butter, black pepper, and Rooibos Tea Accord. The scent is rated by users as a warm, attractive scent perfect for date nights. To help you pick a scent for you, you can also go on their website and take their quiz which will tell you which scent is the best fragrance for you based on your lifestyle. The quiz takes less than a minute and gives you personalized results based on what you're looking for. If you're interested, scan my QR code and use Nightmare Vids to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. Very few people experience something so traumatizing at a young age that it sticks with them forever. I'm one of those people. I was maybe seven or eight years old. My older brother and I grew up in a broken household. Our mom raised us. Our dad was a deadbeat and disappeared out of our lives. Our mom worked two jobs to provide for us. She'd sometimes have to work night shifts and would usually have our grandma stay at the house on nights that she had to work. My brother Austin is two years younger than me. We were fortunate enough to have our own bedrooms given the circumstances. We lived in a small house, but for the three of us and on our mom's dime alone, it wasn't terrible. The area in which we lived wasn't amazing though. It was a night like any other. I can't remember if it was a school night or if it was a weekend. I don't remember any tiny details like that. But what I do remember is I was in the living room with my grandma. She was watching TV and I was playing with Legos on my Lego table. I was being loud and making a mess with them because I remember my grandma kept saying, Alex, quiet down. Austin was already in bed. My bedtime was 9.30. Given that it was probably approaching that time, I'm guessing this was a weekend night, otherwise my bedtime would have been earlier. The layout of the house was simple. Living room, dining room, and kitchen are all connected. And then there was a hallway which led to the bathroom and three bedrooms. Our mom's bedroom was at the end of the hall. Mine was in the middle. Our grandma would sleep in our mom's bed when she'd stay over to watch us. Eventually, I had to go to sleep. My grandma would always go to sleep early too, so right after saying goodnight to me, she would go to the bathroom to brush her teeth and stuff before going to sleep as well. I was never one to be afraid of the dark or anything. My mom says I used to be a really brave child, but that night, I woke up in the middle of the night. Something unusual for me because I remember myself being a very heavy sleeper. I heard something outside in the hallway, creaks in the floor. The wood floors in that house were always very creaky. Anytime someone walked down the hall, you'd hear it. I thought my grandma was going to the bathroom. However, the creaking didn't stop. It sounded like the creaks were moving back and forth. I got out of bed and went to the door to listen. Now I heard whispering. I was more confused than anything. I thought my grandma was talking to Austin. I opened the door and looked into the hallway, and what I saw still haunts me. There was a tall, naked, skinny woman leaning on the wall with her head between her arms. She was whispering stuff to herself, and then, like a deer in headlights, her head whipped around to look at me. I screamed for my grandma like a little girl and slammed my door shut. There were pounds on my door, and the woman on the other side was screaming a name. Jeremy, Jeremy, open the door. I kept screaming as loud as I could for my grandma, and I heard her scream in the hallway. What I distinctly remember was my grandma screaming, get the fuck out of here. The woman screamed, where is Jeremy? My grandma was in her mid-sixties at the time, and she was still pretty quick. She yelled at me to keep my door locked, and she managed to fend off this crazy woman as she also called the police at the same time. I don't know how she did it, but my grandma was one tough woman. The woman left the house screaming, Jeremy. And after locking the door, my grandma came to hug both me and Austin, who was awake and also crying from the commotion. We all sat huddled together until the police came. By that time, 
My grandma told us to just go back to sleep. This simply was a matter of my grandma not locking one of the doors mixed with living in an already shady area. That woman had to be on crack or something. Seeing what I saw at such a young age did a number on me. I couldn't sleep alone for a long time. It was this incident that really resulted in us moving out of that house not long after. Let me give you some context before the story begins. When I was 19 years old, I lived a pretty normal life. I had just finished high school the year before the story takes place. I had always been one for horror anything, whether it was movies, games, jump scares, you name it, and I loved it. I never seemed to be afraid of anything, and I loved that. It allowed me to go and do things that made me appear tougher to girls who I was interested in at the time or who were interested in me. I thought of it almost like a superpower. My friend had always talked about this REM-induced real-life nightmare called sleep paralysis. I, however, had never experienced such a thing. My friend Megan suffered from extreme lucid dreaming. She explained to me several times about how certain stimulators or outside factors could play into her dreams and mold them into what could potentially be a heavenly experience full of fun and wonder, or it could just as easily turn into a bone-chilling nightmare straight out of hell. Being the light sleeper I am, I saw no chance of it occurring, so I kind of just let it go right over my head. One night, Megan texted me and asked me to come over, as she had just suffered another so-called evil experience due to her sleep condition. When I arrived, I found her asleep again, seemingly peacefully. I took a seat on her stool that she had for her makeup dresser right by the window and started playing a game on my phone. 30 minutes or so went by, and I figured she was peacefully asleep and it would probably be okay for me to leave as long as I let her know that I stopped by as she requested. But suddenly, Megan awoke and started screaming. This was a different kind of scream though, a type of scream I had never heard before, especially from her. It was almost mumbled, I don't know how else to describe it. Her eyes bulged open, and I ran over to her side. I asked her if she was having a bad dream. She started shaking. I grabbed a hold of her to try to calm her down, but the tremors grew. I asked her what was going on, but no response. I figured this was just another one of her so-called sleep paralysis episodes. I did my best to comfort her. After about 30 or so seconds went by, she regained full control of her body. I made sure she was okay and I left back for my house, as it was almost 1 in the morning. Right as I got home, I received a very panicked text reading, the hallucinations won't stop. I asked her to clarify what she meant, but no response. After about 30 minutes went by, I took it upon myself to head back over to her place. When I arrived, I noticed the illumination of red and blue covering her front porch and the surrounding road signs. I ran up to her house, desperately trying to find out what happened. As I approached the house, I noticed Megan was speaking with one of the officers on the scene. When I went up to talk to her, Megan and the officer walked me over to a more secluded area. What I found out still sends chills up my spine to this day. Apparently when I had went over to Megan's that night, she wasn't asleep at all. She was pretending to be. Evidently right behind me was a tall, skinny, homeless man hiding in her closet. The police had also found a very large kitchen knife on him as well. The theory to this day is Megan thought she was having an episode when in reality, this very real man was quietly creeping towards her in her bedroom. Supposedly, when I had entered her house, it was enough to spook the man into hiding, and my presence was enough to keep him hidden. This gave Megan the time to call 911 and report the situation, which in turn resulted in the police arriving almost immediately after I had left. Thankfully, the man was taken into custody rather quickly. To this day, I don't know what to think about that night other than I could have very easily saved her life simply by keeping her company during what I thought was a very stressful situation, which in turn could have resulted in some very scary and heinous acts that would have taken place if I had been there any later. I hope I never experienced such a thing. That would be what finally trips my fear factor without a doubt. Around 10 years ago, I moved out of my mom's house into my first apartment in the city of Chicago. 
The place was a nice three-bedroom apartment on the south side of the city in a friendly neighborhood by the University of Illinois. I lived with two roommates, Tom and Mike. Mike was a good friend of mine, while Tom was a good friend of Mike's, who I had not met prior, although we ended up getting along just fine. One night, about a month after moving in, I met up with a few friends of mine for drinks at a bar more in the center of the city, around 10 minutes from my place. It was a good time, and I ended up getting slightly drunk before getting into a cab at 1am and heading home. Upon walking into my apartment, I noticed that Tom's door was open, showing that he was staying at his girlfriend's place, while Mike's door was closed with the light from his TV shining underneath the crack. I would made my way to my bedroom and put on my own TV before lying down to prepare for sleep. After around 10 minutes, I heard my doorbell ring. Half asleep, I woke up confused as it was 1.30 in the morning, so I ignored it. A few seconds later, the doorbell rang again, and then again a few seconds after that. It's important to mention that my roommate Mike had a good amount of side cash by dealing weed to a few people. He was also a huge stoner himself, so the idea that he fell asleep while waiting for a late night customer to come over was not out of the realm of possibility. With this in mind, I went over to my intercom and asked who was there. A girl's voice answered back, It's Emma, I'm here to see Mike. Thinking that my suspicions had been confirmed, I exited out of my front door and headed down the stairs. The door to the outside of our apartment building was made of tall glass, so you could easily identify any potential visitors. Here, I saw an attractive, college-age blonde girl with glasses waiting patiently outside. I had never seen this person before, however, she appeared to be non-threatening, and besides having random customers over to grab weed, Mike would also have some random girls over to hook up with from time to time. Because of this, I let my guard down slightly and cracked the door open. The girl then repeated what she had said moments earlier over the intercom. Hi, I'm here to see Mike. I replied, okay, he's here, just follow me up. And I held the door open for her. She grabbed the handle and I turned around to head back up the stairs. As I was walking back up, I quickly noticed that this Emma girl was not following me up. I glanced over my shoulder and saw that she was still standing outside holding the door open. Only now she was staring off to her right, almost as if waiting for someone. At this moment, a tidal wave of fear crashed over me as I realized something horrible was more than likely about to happen. I continued walking up to my place, quicker now. After turning the corner of the stairs, I heard the door swing open and then heavy footsteps running up the stairs behind me. I looked over my shoulder again, and what I saw shook me to my core. A tall, gangly man with sunken in eyes, greasy long hair down to his shoulders was running up the stairs straight at me. He was wearing a sleeveless black t-shirt, and apart from the cheap-looking tribal tattoos I saw creeping up his arms, I noticed he was also holding what looked like a lead pipe in his right hand. At this moment, my body shot full of adrenaline as I turned around and raced back up the stairs and into my I stood facing the now closed door, paralyzed as the man hit the door three more times while shouting obscenities at me. He eventually gave up and ran down the stairs and out the front. Instead of going down to let her in himself, Mike buzzed her up after just hearing her name, with his train of thought being him thinking that she was a friend of mine. When she reached the door to our unit, he opened it and let her in. He said it seemed like she was confused, mentioning that she was looking for someone named Tim. Mike responded by saying his own name, and that no one named Tim lived here. He mentioned she stayed near the entrance of the unit and kept reaching behind her to make sure the door stayed open before leaving only a few moments later. After hearing this, my theory is that these same people came earlier in the day, and not expecting to have someone just let them up through the buzzer, the girl made the mistake of forgetting to keep the door to the building open, rendering the attacker unable to enter during this first attempt. Either way, we both got extremely lucky that night. We did call the police, who arrived and asked for more information about what happened. They asked if there was anyone we knew who might want to do us harm, and we answered no 
which was the truth, as this seemed to be a completely random attack. The cops left soon after, saying that there was nothing much they could do. We never saw that Emma girl or her scumbag partner again. This story happened to me four years ago when I was in my mid-twenties. This whole experience will probably scar me for life and it's still vividly imprinted in my mind. The day was the 15th of June and I had the house to myself because my parents were on a two-week vacation in France. It was sometime after dusk, probably around 8 p.m., and the weather was scorchingly hot. Believe me when I say I was sweating my ass off with just my tank top and shorts on. The heat was so unbearable that I allowed in some fresh air opening all the living room and bedroom windows, planning on closing them right before hitting the hay. Now before fast forwarding, I must mention that I was feeling extremely exhausted. On that same day I had taken three exams in the morning and played a volleyball match in the afternoon. Thus, once I ate my dinner, while browsing social media in my room, I collapsed into bed without even realizing. I woke up at around 3 a.m. to the muffled sounds of thunderbolts and a draft of cold, fresh air hitting my face. A strong wind was blowing, and all of the shutters left open were noisily banging. Still drowsy, I flicked on the lamp, but the light wouldn't turn on. I checked the plug using my phone flashlight, but everything was fine begrudgingly climbed out of bed and looked out my bedroom window. There were menacing rainy black clouds in the horizon. A typical late night summer storm was approaching. Given that every lamppost in the street was off, I instantly knew there had been a blackout. Phone flashlight in hand, I dizzily headed down the hallway to shut the windows closed before rain started pouring down. When I got to the last window though, I noticed the mosquito net lifted up. This struck me as weird, since I was quite positive I hadn't left it that way. Getting a little paranoid, I turned behind me to shine the flashlight around the living room and check my surroundings. The furniture was still in place. No drawers or closet doors left open, no decorative objects missing or moved in unfamiliar positions. Everything seemed normal. I briefly peeked my head out of my window to look outside. Trees swaying in the howling wind, leaves shaking in a frenzy powerful display of nature's force, but still nothing remotely suspicious. Maybe the mechanism is faulty or the strong wind somehow pushed it up. Against my better judgment, I convinced myself it was useless to lose sleep over it. Feeling relieved, I closed the shutters and started walking back to my bedroom, eager to get a decent night's rest. Little did I know that night would be anything but pleasant. I happened to casually turn my head to the flight of stairs connected to the attic when a vivid burst of light flashing from up there caught my eyes. I paid it no mind. The attic was adorned with huge glass windows, so it was no wonder to see light spreading across the room. It was probably a sheet lightning. I kept walking, subconsciously waiting for the thunder to come. But it never did. I stopped in my tracks. Given that the flash I saw was powerful and bright, the lightning had to be pretty close. So why couldn't any rumbling noise be heard? I started to think, maybe it wasn't lightning. What if it was a flashlight? As doubt crept in, my heart began to race. I quickly put two and two together, and now the strange occurrence of the mosquito net left up made much more sense. The nightmarish realization hit me that an intruder could have broken into my house. At first, I panicked. Did they hear me shutting the windows? Were they carrying any weapons? Did they plan on just robbing my house? Or did they also have worse intentions? Normally I would call my parents to deal with it, but since they were away, it was all on me now. While those sickening thoughts were swirling in my mind, the distinct sound of a doorknob being twisted and turned made me instantly snap out of my catatonic state. I shot my head to face the living room entrance, and through the glass frame, I spotted a shadowy figure just a few inches outside of the front door. There was a person standing there most likely an accomplice of the guy upstairs. Words are not enough to describe how powerless and defenseless I felt. Despite the overwhelming fear, I did my best to keep my cool. Trying to make as little noise as possible, I tiptoed in the direction of the stairs leading down to the basement, which was directly connected to the garage. I figured I could safely escape from there. While I was making my descent down, still using my phone as a source of light, I dialed 911 
and speaking as softly as possible, I informed the operator about what just happened. He tried to calm me down and reassured me that the police would be there in less than 10 minutes. He also added I should lock myself in a safe room and wait for the officers to show up. I was about to reply that I could easily sneak outside through the garage door, when all of a sudden I lost the call. I immediately checked the phone and realized that down there I had no signal. As if it wasn't enough, I also noticed the battery was almost dead. Once I reached the basement, I nervously assessed what to do. I could try and find an emergency flashlight, but now I was so close to escaping from the house that I didn't want to waste time rummaging through the drawers. Besides, I was mindful that the intruders upstairs could have heard me, so in the heat of the moment, I exited the basement as fast as I could. Nonetheless, while making my way towards the garage door, I got a feeling in my gut telling me I was being watched. I don't even know why. Maybe my sixth sense had picked up on something. But I pointed my phone to illuminate the back seats of my car. And there he was. A man's face stuck to the rearview mirror. A disgusting, revolting face with dead, bulgingly wide eyes and a malicious, yellowish grin spreading across its cheeks. He kept staring at me, so intently it almost looked like he was piercing into my soul. He slid his dirty hand against the glass, waving me hello in an unnatural slow motion. And at that point, it happened. My phone battery died, turning off the flashlight and leaving me in the middle of a total darkness. I felt my heart in my throat. I had never been more scared in my entire life. My whole body was quivering and shaking in fear. When I heard the car door opening, I lost it. I screamed. I screamed like a little girl as I somehow managed to unlock the garage door and bolt outside, climbing up the driveway ramp. By that time, heavy rain had started pouring down. I hopped over the gate and ran to the nearest house, yelling like a lunatic for the neighbors to rush outside. They came out in shock and I explained to them the whole situation, almost out of breath and soaking wet. In the meantime, I heard sirens in the distance. Two police cars rolled down the street and I practically ran into the officer's arms, screaming that there were three strangers in my house. Four agents went into my house, guns drawn, while another one took my description of the events. Those three men were all gone though, and to this day, I don't think they've ever been caught. Some antiques which held some value were stolen, however, I must say it was no big deal for my family. For the remainder of the night, I couldn't sleep at all. I kept tossing and turning, jumping at the slightest sounds ruminating relentlessly on the horrific experience. But I kid you not, another chilling surprise was lying in wait. When morning came, I spotted a small piece of paper sticking out of the edge of my bed. I picked it up and went frozen stiff. The following words were written. Bye bye beauty, you look cute when you sleep.